I have spent my career with people who have done the extraordinary. They all started out ordinary. To perform at your best, what are the basics? Flow states are not binaries. You're not in the zone or out of the zone. It's actually a four-stage cycle. It's an optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best and we perform our best. Flow is so joyous, so addictive, so pleasurable, so much of our best feeling on earth that once an activity starts producing flow, we automatically go back to that. Let's talk about the simplest things people can do if they want more flow in their life. What do you make of when you turn that macro flow dial up to 11 and those states of consciousness become so rapturous that mystical things start happening? Flow can explain synchronicity, it can't explain serendipity because it allows you to sort of get closer and closer and closer to these really interesting mysteries. There's nothing special about the people who do really special things. We're all capable of so much more than we know. Hello, beautiful beings. Welcome back to the Know Thyself podcast, where every single week we get the honor and privilege to sit down with a brilliant mind, beautiful soul, to sit down and see what we can learn more about ourselves and the world around us at deeper and deeper levels. My guest today is a New York Times bestselling author, author of many incredible books, such as Stealing Fire, The Art of Impossible, The Rise of Superman, and new book, Nar Country. He is an award-winning journalist, and he is the founder and executive director at the Flow Research Collective. And he is an individual that is a world-class leading expert um, at the human high performance state of consciousness known as flow. Stephen Kotler, thank you for coming on the show, my friend. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. People tune into this podcast because they're trying to become the best, most self-realized, actualized version of themselves. And there's this Taoist maxim that I actually came across recently that I absolutely love. And it says that the master does nothing, yet leaves nothing undone. And what I take from that is that there is a place within ourselves. There's a state of consciousness that we can have access to where the sense of being a doer ceases to exist. What I feel like is flow and what you share so much about. And so I would love for you to share how the, the possibility of reaching the state of consciousness within ourselves, where the, the feeling and the sensation of being a doer can kind of stop, but yet you are extremely effective in the world and in what you do in your physical activity. And so do you feel like that is an uh, accurate description of what flow would be? I'm going to give you an uneasy answer, yes and no. Sure. So um, let's start with the no um, and then work our way to the yes. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting question. You're asking a good question. Um, so, and this is, you actually jumped to an argument that's sort of been at the heart of flow research for a while, which is neurobiologically, if you look in the brain, flow activates a number of networks, cognitive control network, which is what allows you to focus really intensely and cut out the world, which is one of the things that happens in flow, right? You stay very focused on the task at hand. The other network that's active is the goal-directed network. So the goal-directed network is only active when we're active. So the interesting question about the doer doing nothing, is he talking about flow? And what's interesting about this is, and I spent I started, when I came into flow, my early work was on what you could call the neurobiology of spiritual experiences or mystical experiences. Um, and I was looking at flow. So I've spent a lot of years scouring like the world for, okay, what, did, what was flow called in this culture? What was flow called in this culture? What is it called in this, right? That sort of thing. And um, we know, for example, flow isn't enlightenment. It may be closest, if you're going to use a term from East, Eastern philosophy, to what the Japanese describe in the Gen, Zen tradition as satori, a brief awakening, because it's a state and not a stage. And enlightenment is yeah. a stage, right? Um, so there's this argument of, is flow always a goal-directed, action-based state? versus like meditated trance states, which are are much quieter, right? And this has been a, a long standing argument. Um, the European side of the argument loves to say, no, you can have non-goal directed flow. So that's where their position is. On the American side, we tend to say, no, 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 it's always goal directed flow. I don't know where I come down yet. Okay. I'm not I'm not actually sure. Mm -hmm. I just know that this debate has been going on for yeah. 25 years. It's probably gonna still Go on, that said, the similarity between sort of deep meditative states and flow states are neurobiologically also very, very similar, right? So the things that are producing that stillness inside. So for example, why does that happen in flow? One of the reasons it happens is because your emotions 
are almost completely turned off in flow. Uh, Martin Seligman, sort of one of the one of the godfathers of positive psychology, uh, in his book Authentic Happiness, points out that flow. Uh, you need emotions to modify behavior, right? That's what emotions do. They tell us to act this way or act that way, and things like that. Um, which is one of the reasons people say don't hang on to your emotions, especially in the spiritual traditions, right? Because they're literally meant to be lightning quick behavioral signals that are over and gone in a second. They're not meant to linger. Um, but all of that gets turned off in flow because if one of the things that happens in flow, right, is every decision, every la action leads seamlessly, perfectly to the next, right? It's, and if you don't have to course correct behavior, if everything's already perfect in what you're doing, you don't have any need for emotions. So the entire, the limbic system, the amygdala, all that portion of the brain gets what they would call downregulated, turned down, it's really quiet, right? That's where the stillness comes from. You can get the same thing in meditative states and the deactivation of the prefrontal cortex that you get in flow, you can also get in certain meditative states. So there's a lot of overlap. And the, the one question is this, this goal directed, this action question that you're asking. And it, as of yet, not solved. That was sort of a really long way of <laughs> saying, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you picked, there's a lot of things that you, that you touched on that I want to pick up on. I think that when people have experienced or taste what flow is like, there's this lack of a sense of self. Totally. And so I think it can kind of feel analogous or very similar to where people have these spiritual experiences and they feel their inherent interconnectedness. There's a sensation of the world, but there is not this uh, me that is so rigid mm -hmm. that is the For perceiver sure. of it. Yeah. And that's, I mean, one of the reasons I feel it's so important to train people in flow, um, people come to the Flow Research Collective because they want more productivity, better performance, those sorts of things. And that's great. But what I get in the bargain is increased empathy and uh, an expanded uh, what we call ecological awareness, right? But it basically moves sort of, most people are like human, they're self first and they're very human centric, right? Um, flow expands that boundary. You first you, you empathize with other people and then it goes beyond the border of species and it'll go into animals and plants and ecosystems and extends outward. The psychedelics will do the same thing. This is sort of well known. Um, sometimes some of the meditative uh, states can do it, but not like psychedelics are known for it. Flow is really known for it. Um, that sort of like the self disappearing and then the, the expanded consciousness um, that especially transverses like the border of species that's a you know it sounds like a very spiritual kind of experience right yeah. it's got all all the hallmarks there and it's certainly um one of the things that shows that these experiences are one of the things that show up in the spiritual traditions and all of most of the wisdom traditions talk about you know this sort of thing um so again Long way of saying maybe, but yeah. we're, I, you know, I, I tend to, I tend to agree with you on that. What is your description of what flow state is for? Oh, uh, what's the definition? Yeah. Uh, scientifically, the definition is useless, but I'll start there. <laughs> it's uh, an optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best and we perform our best. Um, more specifically, flow refers to any of those moments of rapt attention and total absorption because so focused on, on what you're doing on the task at hand, everything else just starts to disappear. Action and awareness are going to merge. Your sense of self, as we talked about, self-consciousness disappears completely. Voice in your head gets really quiet. The inner critic. Uh, time will pass strangely. Usually, it'll speed up. You get so sucked into what you're doing that, you know, two hours go by and what feels like two minutes Sometimes it can slow down. If you've been in a car crash into that freeze frame effect or seen the matrix bullet time, that'll happen um, as well in flow sometimes. And throughout all aspects of performance, mental and physical tend to go through the roof. So that's flow in a nutshell. That place where we feel like we feel our best and we perform our best, who doesn't want that, right? And we have a $4 trillion altered states economy where a lot of people are seeking that state, that feeling within unconsciously, right? Through drugs, through caffeine, through porn, through video games, through many things that we can kind of alleviate that sense of self and kind of feel more easeful within ourselves that allow that um, optimal state of consciousness to exist. And so I would love for you just to share your thoughts on how we can so often unconsciously go for things that allow us to get to that state of consciousness, but then how we can consciously trigger flow instead of just unconsciously uh seeking unconsciousness see, yeah. in negative ways yeah well that well, just don't have as much negative repercussions right 
One of the things that's interesting about flow, and I've made this argument, other people may disagree. There's, there's again, debate here. I think humans, maybe all animals, because a lot of animals can get into flow, all social mammals can get into flow, and maybe all mammals. Um, but definitely with humans, we seem to move in the direction of optimal performance. It's almost as if the system wants to perform that way. I'll give you a simple example. Uh, I got to tell you a little about uh, flow states have triggers, right? If you want more flow in your life, these triggers are your toolkit. The most famous one is known as the challenge skills balance. It's the idea of flow follows focus. So that's what all the triggers do. They drive our attention to the present moment. The challenge skills balance, it's often called the golden rule of flow. It's the most famous of the triggers. And it's a simple idea. We pay the most attention to the task at hand when the challenge of the task slightly exceeds our skill set. So you want to stretch but not snap. If I were to explain that emotionally, I would say there's a midpoint between boredom and anxiety that they talk about as the flow channel. Boredom, there's not enough stimulation here. I'm not really paying attention. Anxiety, whoa, way too much. I can't stop paying attention. In between is the flow channel. Uh, if you speak physiology at all, it's what's known as the irk stops and curve. But all this is sort of besides the point. I want to talk about procrastination. So we are told culturally procrastination is a bad thing. Don't do this. This is, and there's, probably some common sense there. But what's interesting about procrastination is it's also a system moving towards optimal performance. So think about the challenge skills balance, boredom and anxiety, right? And in between is this flow channel. So procrastination takes one of two forms. Either the thing that you're putting off doing bores you. It's not interesting enough. So you can't, right? What's actually happening is your brain is saying, hey, you can't focus on this thing. You'll never drop into flow and, and be your best. So put it off until the time stress builds up to the point that you're in that challenge skills sweet spot, right? And if it's overwhelming, if you're on the other side of the coin, you get the, you get the same thing. And so what I always tell people is if you feel that urge to procrastinate, first figure out, are you procrastinating because the thing bores you or because the thing stresses you out? If it bores you, I'll give you an example from my own life. So I came up as a journalist and I was poor and had to write hundreds of articles all the time. And most of them I loved. I'm a very curious person and, you know, you, I can pretty much find something in any subject that I'm interested in. But every now and again, an article would come up that was just like, I'm doing this for the money. That's all that's happening here. Um, and I would procrastinate it, right? Like I put it off and it's a bad idea. You don't want to put off like an article that's due for an editor that's writing you a paycheck to the night before. What if my dog gets sick? What if, you know, something happens? So it's a lousy idea, but I had the same, like I was putting things off. So I started doing, making the challenge harder for myself. I would say, okay, write this article for Wired Magazine in the style of Charles Dickens or something like that. Something <laughs> really absurd where like, yeah, I was curious about how Dickens wrote his sentences, but trying to like sneak a Charles Dickens style article past my Wired Magazine editor. That's like, you know, the kind of challenge where you're like, it's goofy, but it was just enough to like, oh, this is kind of goofy. Like I'm writing an article about data caves in the style of like Charles Dickens. And that's just weird enough that it raised the challenge level and I was no longer bored by it and I could get it done. When the task is too hard and too big and too anxious. You just want to chunk it down so what's in front of you is much more manageable. But all this is a long way of saying we do that naturally, right? We procrastinate naturally and we think it's a bad thing. It's got this cultural bad rap. But if you look at it from the perspective of peak performance, my argument is no, no. It's your system saying, hey, you're capable of much better performance and let's try to create the situation that will produce that. Part one. The second answer to your question is about how we relate to dopamine. So all of the all of the substances and activities you just mentioned, whether we're talking about sex addiction or gambling addiction or shopping addiction or drug addiction or alcohol addiction or internet porn or you know, take your pick. It's all about that like dopamine treadmill. Give me more dopamine, give me more dopamine, give me more dopamine. We have t-shirts that collected that say never trust the dopamine, <laughs> right? And um, for this very reason, and it's um, flow, you get a little bit of dopamine, but you get four other reward chemicals that are just as potent, just as pleasurable. So you get, you hold, there's a lot more going on than, than just dopamine. Um, that dopamine loop, I don't know if there's any easy way to do it. You just, uh, to me, and this I think is 
probably, you know, this sort of what I'm about to say in is probably found in all the wisdom traditions. They have different ways of doing this, but you literally just have to sort of break that easy attachment to fast dopamine, which um, is a, I think at some point in everybody's life, you have to, you're going to have to do that. Um, you don't have to do anything, mm -hmm. but if you want overall life satisfaction, if you want space, well-being, if you want peace, um, you're going to have to break the addiction to easy dopamine, um, which is not to say flow. I mean, flow is a very addictive state, way more addictive than than dopamine, right? If mm. like, do you want to talk on your cell phone? Do you want to go surfing? Most people end up going surfing. Why? Because surfing will drop you into flow and the cell phone will just give you dopamine, right? Like we, when you put the rewards side by side, people tend to move towards flow over the, like the easy, fast dopamine hit. Um, but I think you have to break that, just the stickiness of dopamine. And it's just practice, right? It's like everything else. I'll give you a weird example that happened to me. So they're just now talking about dysfunctional daydreaming. People who have, it usually happens in childhood, people with really rough childhoods tend to escape into daydreams. And um, it becomes dysfunctional because when you come back from the daydream, reality is nowhere near as good as your, your daydream right? You're trying to escape reality. So what happens is you end up living in those daydreams. And that was definitely my childhood. And I got to a point somewhere between middle school and high school. I don't exactly know what happened, but I started to realize I was like, oh, wow, this is actually interfering with not only does it feel bad when I come to reality, because reality in comparison to my daydream is, you know, um, negative, but it, uh, it was too sticky. It was getting in the way of like, I wasn't even paying attention to class. I wasn't even there kind of thing. And I started, I was like, oh, this is a habit. And daydreaming produces a little bit of dopamine. It feels good, right? And so I learned sort of early on how, like I had to just sort of wrestle my brain back from myself um, early on, but it took a while to, to break that link. And it's, you know, it's like any addiction. It's, it's you go back and forth a little bit with it and, and finally you, you break free. I don't know if that's it, the answer yeah. you were looking for. But I think like, it's really interesting because a lot of people definitely struggle with procrastination. I have earlier on for sure. And there's, I think, whether it's from stress or boredom, like you spoke to, those are powerful indicators and inquiries people can have to gain awareness as to why am I putting off what I'm putting off right now. And I feel like the more that we clarify a passion, a purpose in our life that allows us to um, generally go after something that we're excited for in life, then we're not constantly facing this uphill battle of doing things that we're not really excited to do in the first place. So how important do you feel like it is to clarify your passion and purpose if you want to be able to sink more into flow in your life? So that's a great question. And the answer is super important. So the art when possible um, follows the order of our biology, right? It's a peak performance blueprint, but our biology was designed evolutionarily when I'm talking about it to work in a specific order. So if you're interested in peak performance, if you're interested in flow, I always talk about the importance of stacking internal or intrinsic motivators, right? There's a difference between external motivators and internal motivators, extrinsic motivators, money, sex, fame, shit in the world that we'll work hard to get. Um, internal motivators, there's a lot of them, but there's five major ones, curiosity, passion, purpose, autonomy, and mastery. And they're literally biologically, one is designed to be built into the other. And the way I sort of break this down for people is curiosity is, is the simplest motivator in the world. And by the way, when we talk about a motivator, right, one easy way to think about it is one, one of the biggest things that motivators give us is focus for free. So the brain's an energy hog. Right? It uses 25% of our energy and that's at rest, right? So anytime you're trying to do something like pay attention to something, that's a lot more energy. And um, anything that gives you focus for free, that's what motivation is great for, right? So think about curiosity. If you're curious about a subject, you're not working really hard to pay attention to it, right? It happens automatically. So curiosity is the most basic of the intrinsic motivators. It is designed to be built into passion. What that literally means is passion gets really mystified in today's world and um, ascribed a lot of a, a lot of things that um, maybe it's not. And it's interesting because philosophically, by the way, most people we talk about passion as a really good thing. From like Plato until 
Nietzsche, right? And, and, and whether you're talking about the Western philosophical tradition or religious and spiritual traditions, passion is a bad thing, right? right? Hume says, oh, wait, we've got this, um, excuse me, Kant says we have this like moral passion, right? What he calls the categorical imperative. Um, he's one of the only philosophers sort of along the way who, who had some use for passion. But most philosophers were like, no, no, this is bad. This gets us away from kind of rational intellectual thought, which is, is what we should prize. So it's interesting. It's only been in the past, 50, 60, 70 years that we've started to go, oh no, passion is really important. It's really a good thing, right? Um, which I just find fascinating. But curiosity, when you can find the intersection of multiple curiosities, right? Not one curiosity, sometimes that's enough for people to build it into passion, but as a general rule, there's just not enough energy there, right? And it won't hold your attention over the long haul. But if you can... I always start people may make a list of 25 things you're curious about and then look for where they intersect with one another and play at those intersections for a while. This is the other thing that people get wrong with passion. A lot of people are looking for it in purpose is they want it really fast. Passion and purpose are not designed. Like that's how you like get two years into like your passion project to go, oh, wow, it was just a phase. This isn't really who I am or what I want to be doing. That's really demotivating. That's an awful place to be. So I always tell people, build passion slowly, right? Build purpose slowly. But passion is built out of multiple curiosities intersecting. Once you have passion, it's a great motivator, as you know, right? Think about romantic love. Think about when you're falling in love, that passion you feel. You can't just stop focusing on the person you're in love with. It happens automatically. You get tremendous amounts of focus for free. The problem of passion over time is... So if you go into passion psychology, they divide passion between harmonious passion and obsessive passion. Obsessive passion goes in a negative direction. Harmonious passion goes in a positive direction. It's difficult to separate the two, right? And I've seen like what they would call harmonious passion. I'm writing a book. It's going great. Like, and suddenly I get stuck and I get, you know, really obsessive and it can be kind of a dark spiral for a while, right? So... I just say passion in general is a great motivator, but it's a little too selfish for the long haul, right? Which is where purpose comes into play. Now, I'm going to give you a bunch of geeky science to why passion and purpose are important. I talked about motivators. Passion is essentially about producing feel-good neurochemistry, norepinephrine and dopamine. That's what you get from passion is those two chemicals. Purpose is interesting. Those are, by the way, very individual motivators. Once you attach purpose to your passion, you couple your passion to something outside yourself that you'd like to see fixed in the world, right? Something bigger than yourself that will help the planet, help other people, that sort of thing. That's purpose. You get the pro-social neurochemistry, right? Because you've extended it beyond yourself. So you get, you know, dopamine and norepinephrine, which are really powerful motivators. And just like, if you're not familiar with neurochemistry, when I say dopamine and norepinephrine, you put those things together, that's the cocktail called romantic love. So we were talking about it a second ago. We've all fallen in love, that amazing feeling. That's norepinephrine and dopamine. That's what produces that. With purpose, you start to add in serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphins. These are the pro-social chemicals. So endorphins um, are opiates, right? They're internal opiates, but that's a mother and a child or a father and a child, right? That's that parental bond we get with our offspring, really strong, really tight. We know about oxytocin and everybody knows about serotonin is like the calming chemical um, at this point. So you start getting those pro-social chemicals. What does that mean? It means way more motivation, way more focus for free. That's why purpose is such a useful thing from a peak performance perspective. We can circle back and talk about meeting a life stuff with purpose and all that stuff if you want. But once you have purpose, what does the system want next? It wants autonomy, the freedom to pursue that purpose, right? It's worthless to have a purpose if you can't actually go after it. And once you have that freedom, once you have autonomy, you want mastery, the skills to pursue that purpose well. So when you talk about the big five motivators, and I talk a lot about stacking motivations, and this is where peak performance, I always say it starts there. And one of the reasons is flow follows focus. And when all five of your intrinsic motivators are tightly stacked like that, it drives a lot of focus. It also turns out that all five of the things that I just mentioned are flow triggers, all of them. Mastery is another way of saying the challenge skills balance. Because flow follows focus. We pay the most attention to the task at hand when the challenge is slightly harder than our skill set. So you're always stretching. 
a little outside your comfort zone, getting a little better, getting a little better, getting a little better. That's the path to mastery. Um, passion produces dopamine, which drives focus. Purpose, dopamine, and a bunch of these other things. Autonomy is interesting. So flow follows focus. And it turns out autonomy is really tightly coupled in the brain to focus. We as humans, we like to drive the, our bus. We like to drive the bus. And we pay more attention to where the bus is going and where the one's driving. Everybody sort of knows this, right? When it's, when it's your thing, you care a whole lot more. You pay a whole lot more attention. So autonomy, there's a bunch of stuff that's positive about freedom, but it's really about focus from a flow, peak performance perspective. But you're getting curiosity is the same thing. You're getting all five of these sort of flow triggers in a stack and as a sort of precondition. If you want more flow in your life, not a bad place to start. Right, the triggers are your toolkit, and this is a really this is also where your biology wants to start from, a, sort of an evolutionary perspective. Hmm. I love that. There is so much there in that kind of ladder and how it stacks. I think is going to be super helpful for people, and I, it rings true to me that. Let me say. Let me add one other thing. Yeah. Just because this is the mistake everybody makes on passion and purpose, mm -hmm. and it's I just find it really helpful to know. Yeah. Sorry to cut you off. No. So. When I say passion to you or to most people, right, you th get an image of like, if you're my age, you see Michael Jordan going in for like a windmill right. dunk. If you're younger, maybe you're Steph Curry shooting a three or LeBron with a windmill dunk. Either way, that's what our image of passion is or Yo-Yo Ma playing the cello. Like that, it's, it's, and that is passion, but it's mature adult passion at the end. That's what it looks like at the end. That's the where mastery, you're going, yeah. right? What people forget is, what does it look like on the front end? What does it look like when you're just starting out, right? We hear everybody saying, I want passion, I want purpose. And they, what, they, what I hear coming out of their mouth is, what I really want is a lightning bolt from the sky, right? That just suddenly I'm going, oh, this is my passion. This is my purpose. I've discovered it. One doesn't work that way. Passion and purpose are earned a little bit of interest at a time. You have to build them up in yourself, one. Two, Passion at the front end, it's a little kid in a driveway shooting hoops trying to get that basketball to fall. It's not Michael Jordan, LeBron James at the end of the arc. Sure, that's where you're going, but you're actually looking for So when you think about that bolt of lightning that you want to strike you, let's say it does strike you. What's it going to feel like on the front end? It's going to feel like a little kid with a curiosity, right? Can I get better at this? Can I get better at that? That's what it feels like on the front end. So people get it wrong. They don't have enough patience with themselves. Um, and it, you really need that. But they get it wrong because they're expecting this big, weighty, kind of heavy, mystical, thick thing that feels spiritual. Oh, my God, I know what my passion is. I know what my purpose is. It's not what it's like on the front end at all. Not for, I've never met, I've talked about passion and purpose with tens of thousands of people at this point. I've never heard one story where it's, you know, all consuming, it shows up fully formed on the front. It just doesn't work that way. That's right. not really how our biology works. Now, let me give you the caveat because we do have love at first fight. Right, we, maybe we don't have love at f first sight, but I've certainly met a bunch of people who have, you know, had that experience. I've probably had it once or twice over the course of my life as well. That's instant passion. So it seems like romantically, maybe that's possible a little bit, even though we all know, like anybody who's been in a relationship, but I don't care how passionate you are at the front end, you're still gonna have to earn that passion over time and work at it, right? So it may come with that crazy feeling. I mean, it's still gonna require a massive amount of effort. This is the other thing that people get wrong about passion is they think it means easy, right? Oh, I've got my passion, I've got my purpose. It's no, it, these are burdens, purpose especially. So my purpose, one of my, has always been to make the world a better place for animals, right? This is my wife and I run a dog sanctuary. I've been involved in environmental and animal rights issues for 30 years at this point. That's a purpose. Do you know what that is like in the real world? Have I gotten anywhere, right? Have I, have I, have I done anything? Mm hmm for my, pro I mean, I've worked, see, I'll give you an example. We run hospice care dog sanctuary. In 20 years, about 800 animals have been through our facility. So we've, we've, we've taken care of 800 animals. It's amazing. They kill 
they, meaning the U.S. government, euthanizes 10 to 20 million dogs a year in America, okay? Mostly, 50% of those animals for the crime of getting older, right? People, dogs get old, they lose control of their bladders and the balls, and they get dumped into shelters. Um, and for most animals, it's a death sentence. You know, there are very few facilities like ours that, that do this work. But if you think about it, we, for 20 years, my wife and I, I can count on my hands. Maybe I now need my toes to the number of times we've been out to dinner in 20 years. We've taken one trip together away from the dogs and so forth. So there's been some sacrifice to do this. The truth of the matter is, I've worked on this for 20 years. This is, and there's a bunch of other environmental initiatives. This is the most successful one. They kill, let's say it's 10 million dogs a year. We didn't even dent Tuesday. I didn't even dent Tuesday, right? right? Forget about, right? That's purpose is about never reaching your goal, right? If, it, if you've got a real purpose, I want to do this in the world. I mean, you're never fulfilled. You never get there. It's an endless heartbreaking treadmill. So everybody talks about, I want passion. I want purpose. Are you sure? Are you sure? Because purpose is heavy hmm. and it's a burden as much as a blessing. So I hear this from people. And what I really think every time somebody says, oh, I want passion and purpose is no, I want to get laid on a Friday night. That's what I hear. That's what I hear you saying to me. Yeah. I want to do something that's going to make me look good for whoever it is that I'm attracted to. That's what I'm hearing because when I actually, like when you actually see what passion and purpose looks like up close when it's real, it's heavy. It weighs a lot. It's not, it, it, it's not what people think it is. I'm not dissuading anybody. Sure. Like it, it, it makes certain things a lot easier. It makes a lot of things a lot harder. Yeah, it's the burden you're willing to pay for what you feel like needs to come through you and what needs to be done. Yeah, exactly. And and you're happy to make those sacrifices because the alternative is even more painful, right? Not doing that. The but, alternative is more painful. I don't know if you're happy, but you're not bitter. They don't make you sure. right. You don't you don't resent the sacrifice. They're not always pleasing, but you don't tend to resent it yeah. afterwards, right? So I love what you you opened up so many boxes that we could spend hours and hours diving into. But I really love that invitation you gave of just allowing people to explore what those inner curiosities are as kind of the inklings um, on the on the path to realizing their purpose and becoming more self actualized. I was talking to a friend recently who is like kind of stepping into this next stage of his life and he feels like he has all these amazing connections. He has this passion for raising the evolution of consciousness on the planet and he loves production and media. And when I look at my own life and I look at the overlap of my curiosities that have come into this into the show, my my you know, my passion, my curiosities for videography, for filmmaking, for sharing media as medicine and you know, reaching out and being able to share um, conversations that can raise consciousness on the planet. Um, my deep curiosities and passions for having these kind of conversations and the format of like all these things overlap, right? And mm -hmm. they stick, they kind of stack on top of each other, like you're speaking to, to finding that harmonious passion that can, as you continue to go on that path and develops into mastery one day in your life. And I think that's so beautiful. You've shared a quote of yours is that if we are hunting the highest version of ourselves, then we need to turn work into play and not the other way around. And so I'd love for you to share how um, our purpose can, and if we want to become the best version of ourselves and impact and be the most effective version of ourselves, then we need to find that place where it's like that most ease and um, where it can actually feel like play because we're only going to get masterful at something if we really love to do it in the first yeah, place. that's for sure. Um, so let's start with the geeky neuroscience for one second because there's, so this is one of the things that people don't understand about learning. Quick shorthand for how, what, so flow massively amplifies learning and memory, right? It's one of the things that happens in flow. So the Department of Defense did a study of soldiers in flow and they found they learned 240 to 500% faster than normal. So flow is known to massively shorten the path to mastery. Um, normally when we learn, what happens is the brain, you get a little bit of norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is like, I'm awake, I'm alert, I'm a little excited, I'm a little curious, right? That's what's going on on the inside. Um, maybe if uh, there's a goal tied into what you're learning, what you're doing, you'll get a little dopamine. So two neurochemicals boost learning. Great, super useful. When we play, you get norepinephrine, dopamine, and endorphins, right? Really 
big hit of endorphins as a general rule. So one massively amplifies learning, shortens the path to mastery. A to B, it's not quite flow. Flow's a bigger neurochemical dump, but it's much better than regular learning. So one, if you're walking a path to mastery and you want to get there quickly, plays a faster road. Also, because when we're playing, so this is really important as a writer. I'm a writer, I'm a creative. I, I, and there's a time I want to be self-conscious and critical of my work, right? But that's not when I'm actually getting the words down on the text. That's what editing is for, right? When I'm getting the words on the text, I don't want shame, self-consciousness, embarrassment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's all the stuff we tend to get from learning. Oh, I'm trying to get this. I'm trying to get this. And I'm not, I'm not getting any better, right? And we beat ourselves up inside. And if you're wired like me, I really beat myself up inside for not, for not learning. I'm really hard on myself on the inside. So play has been a lifesaver for me because it takes all that crap out of the way for when I need it out of the way. So I always, with my writing, I, you know, I, even if I go in and like, I work, I write every day, right? It's a work thing. I show up at four o'clock in the morning and no matter what else is going on, I'm going to write at least till 8 a.m. And that's going to happen every day um, unless I'm on the road when I read. But like, you know, it's essentially 300 days a year and it has been for 40 years or something like that. Um, that's a discipline. That's a, that's a work effort. But 10 minutes in, I'm playing. Right, it starts out. It's the same thing. I got to get my butt in the chair. I got to get into. But the minute I'm going, and the minute I start getting to noodle with language, I'm playing. And one of the reasons that quote is so important, you got to turn work into play, right? To get to wherever you want to go, is because the road is long. The road is just really, really, really long. And one of the things that peak performers know, and this is uh, this is in our country, the new book. I really talk a lot about this. Um, this is something a, a lot of people sort of get wrong, um, probably for really good reasons. Grit for peak performers is a last resort. Most people, grit is the first tool they, if something gets hard, oh, I, fuck you, I could just tough this out. Overcome I this. it by more force. Right, more, right. <laughs> and that's fine, except it's a recipe for burnout, right? You, that's only gonna, so peak performers will reach for every other motivation possible before going for grit. So we just talked about the big five intrinsic motivators, right? I that's, that's the first place I turn. So if the task is really grueling, sure, I can just get gritty or I can stop and go, what about this is really curious to me? Where's my curiosity in here? What's really cool in here that I'm super interested in? How does this task tie in with my passion and my purpose? I can reframe it that way. Um, or challenge skills balance is something I love to do. Rather than grit, get gritty, can I detune the challenge level a little bit, right? Chunk it down so what's in front of me is smaller or more playful kind of thing and start there and then build back up. So grit is, is, is the tool you, I mean, we're all gonna need it, right? And I always say that like in any given day, first of all, grit's also, a, a, it's limited, right? We're, it's tied to willpower on a daily basis and willpower, drains over the course of the day. So you have a lot of it in the morning, high energy, and it fades as, as as we get towards the end of the day, which is why like you can quit smoking or stay on your diet all day long and then you get to like eight o'clock at night and suddenly you're powering through ice cream, right? Because willpower has, you've used it up and you know, and you have none left sort of at the end of the day. Um, so grit's a limited resource, first of all. And we all know, if you're getting after it in any real way, there's going to be shit that happens every day that you're going to be have to be gritty about, no matter what, right? Just because file under shit happens category. <laughs> so if stuff's going to happen and you're going to have to be gritty anyways, if that's the only tool, like why are so many people burned out? It's because this is the tool they keep reaching for. And there's a lot of other tools in that kit that you want to go to first. So the alternative to like really just if you desire sustainability and the longevity of being able to, uh, for years and years and years, wake up at four and go to eight of just writing in the morning or whatever that version is for somebody where they're really committed and devoted to something, you got to figure out how to, it's you got to figure I, out yeah, how I to always play. Tell, I always tell people, like, don't think I'm getting out of bed because I'm some 
I'm tough or like it's, it's <laughs> none of that stuff. I'm getting out of bed because I'm dying to know where the sentences are going to take me. I'm dying to know what the words are going to do today. Um, it's, fa- it's still fascinating to me. Um, that little bit of magic that comes through in the writing where you're like, you know, this, I know this word, I know this word, I know this word. And suddenly you're like, oh, wow, I didn't know that about myself. Mm. And you see, like, you learn a little thing about yourself or you learn a little thing about the universe or your relationship. You know what I mean? That kind sure. of stuff. Um, that's play for me um, on top of it. And I also, I bake play what I call play for me. Challenges, very, I like challenges. So every one of my book projects, pick a book, there's the ideas I want to communicate, which is, you know, why most people write a book. They, there's a bunch of ideas they want to communicate. Um, that's usually the tiniest part of my motivation. It's usually there's some kind of writing challenge, right? Stealing fire. Stealing fire, the writing challenge was factual density. So that's a very factually dense book. Um, it, on average, has two to three facts per sentence, which is an incredible amount of fact density. You didn't notice, but I spent months and months and months and months and months pouring over, for example, Steven Pinker, who's a, a scientist out of Harvard. who's written a lot of books. He writes really fun books, fun sentences, but very information dense. And I knew we had so much information to cover in Stealing Fire that if I didn't do that, it was going to be like a 2,000 page book that nobody was going to read. So I was like, okay, I got to figure this out. That to me is play. Right, it's it's a challenge. Yeah. It's hard. I don't know how to do it, but it's play. And once I got it down, I got a new tool in my belt that I can use going forward, and that's really exciting to me too. So those kinds of challenges, and there are like six or seven of those built into every one of my books that you know nobody sees. They're just for me, yeah. but they're how I turn work into play. This is great. I can tell that we're in flowing conversation now because it's actually where I was going to take you next, and it's actually a good sign for this podcast and something I want to maybe pin and bring up later about flow and group dynamics. And, okay. um, but, you know, if we're always chasing flow, it doesn't necessarily make space for the part of ourselves that when we learn anything new, we're going to face those inevitable, hard, challenging moments when we're, you know, when we're learning something new. And so I think I've shared on this podcast before, and I love kind of the, those four stages of learning I'm sure you're familiar with, where you start and you're unconsciously incompetent. You just don't know what you don't know in regards to tying your shoelace, learning how to ski, there you still don't even know the thing exists, right? And then you have conscious incompetency where you know you don't know. And then you have uh, conscious competency where it takes a lot of energy and effort to do the thing. You have to think a lot about it. You have to learn how to do the two loops and the and the pull for tying your shoelaces right, or whatever right. it is, pizza and french fries, pizza and french fries whatever skiing. skiing. Yeah. And then we get to that place of unconscious competency where it just becomes second nature and that's super in flow, right? Right. What I want to focus on is that area of conscious competency where you're learning the thing and that often feels like a lot of resistance. It's challenging to learn something new. Learn to scale on the piano, it takes a lot of effort. We all desire that state of flow where we're just masterful and we're doing the thing, but inevitably to get there, you have to focus and get to that point where you're. it's a little bit more clunky. Mm-hmm. And so how do you relate to that? Because a lot of, I think people, when they speak about flow, it's this ideal state of just you know so much ease. But if we're going to learn anything new, which is part of the process of becoming self-actualized, it's going to consist of a lot of those consciously competent moments. So because there's like 17 answers yeah. here. Let, let, me, let me start with uh, the first thing that pops into my mind because you asked a flow specific question. So if you read my books, you know this. Flow states are not binaries. You're not in the zone or out of the zone, right? There are, it's actually a four stage cycle. And you have to move through all four stages of the, uh, of the flow cycle before you can pop back into flow, right? So there's no such thing as a permanent flow state, which is why we, one, we know part flow is not enlightenment, but like I always tell people in the early days of my career, it stopped happening, but people would come up to me about once a month. It was usually a guy, the eye is really, really big. Oh, dude, you got to study me. I'm in flow all the time. <laughs> and it used to happen a lot and I never knew what to say to people. And finally, I just settled on the truth, which is, you know, we have a word for that. We call that schizophrenia, right? (laughs) Mania sometimes, but like Uh that's what that is. There's no such thing as a permanent flow state. And some of the stages of the flow cycle are really unflowy and flow starts with a struggle phase. Why? Because you have to learn things consciously before you can perform them unconsciously. And it's always struggle. So there's always a struggle phase on the front end of a flow state. 
one way or another. In fact, even in miniature. So uh, we just worked on, uh, spent the past three years working on a big paper that came out a couple months ago and what happens in the brain in the first few seconds of flow as we transition into the flow. And one of the things that is becoming more and more clear is you may need to trigger the fight response for a second. Like we've heard about fight or flight, the fight response at the front end of a flow state. So a lot of people cure flow and are like, oh, it's gonna like, I want a flowy mountain bike ride, right? <laughs> Going out for a flowy mountain bike ride is the easiest way to go to the hospital, <laughs> right? You'll get bounced off your bike. Why? Because mountain biking is a violent, aggressive sport. And you have to go out and attack the mountain. And it's through that attacking that you'll actually get into flow. You can't go out seeking flow in that way because you're not bringing enough to the fight. You literally, you need the fight response because it takes tells the brain to put all your focus right here, right now. That's really what it's doing, right? The, the, you, want, you want the testosterone underneath it, right? You don't want to fight anything. You just want the testosterone for focus. Um, so even in miniature, there's going to be struggle, right? It's built in. That's the first thing I want to say. So if you think that a, a lifespan in flow is a life without struggle, disavow yourself of that notion, right? It's literally baked in to the state. The other side of it is most of the time, this is possibly not true with learning some action sports or some combat sports uh, where there are penalties for failure, like physical pain can be a penalty for failure. Getting right? punched in the face. But, right, getting punched <laughs> in the face. Um, and even this isn't entirely true. Struggle is awful. Learning is awful. Mostly because of what, how we're talking to ourselves, right? I've been teaching myself how to draw. I, I have a degree in art from way back, in, but I haven't touched uh, drawing in 30 years. And um, I just came back to it seven months ago. And all I'm doing is making a drawing a day, basically. And usually it's just like, today I'll draw shoulders, today I'll draw trees, today I'll, and then once a week I'll, I'll, I'll try to make art. And I'm certainly not good enough to be, I'm not making art yet, right? I'm, I'm doing, but like I let uh, seven months of doing this, 250 drawings, let's say, there might be three that I might actually show to people. Maybe, maybe, just maybe. And only if I really love you. I posted a couple on uh, social media. Why? What? Because I want to, like, I don't like learning anything in public. It really bothers me. I don't like being bad in public. I don't mind being bad, but I don't like being bad in public. But I want to get over that because it blocks learning. So I'm forcing myself to put some of these drawings out on social media along the way um, just because it, it helps me break down that. But as a general rule, the experience has been remarkably flowy. And one of the reasons is I have zero expectation. I have no... I don't think I'll ever do anything professionally with those drawings. I, I have no plans for an art show or a graphic novel or any any of that stuff. This is this is really just for me. Um, but I don't judge it, right? I, in fact, most if it's good, I'm more surprised than if it's bad. If it's bad, I'm just I'm still learning, right? Usually, what is a win for me is it's bad, but I can see what I did wrong, so I don't have to make that mistake again, right? And that's how I'm looking at it. And I'm calling that a win. If you're going at it that way, the learning process can be incredibly flowy. Now, I'm not dropping into deep, what we would call macro flow, deep macroscopic flow states, um, but I am getting into micro flow, the kind of low grade version of the state almost every time I draw. And it's literally just the, I'm showing up, I'm putting in the work and I've, I'm not judging at all. Now, that's unusual for me. It took me a long time to figure out how to not judge myself, right? I'm, I'm, I'm harsh on myself and, I, and I, I like that about myself. I think one of the reasons I've, I've, I'm successful is because I'm a ruthless taskmaster on myself, but it's gotten to a point where like it can, it can stand in my way and some of it's negative. So I'm trying, especially with drawing, to kind of remove that and, and posting things in public is, is, is taking that a little farther and making it a little more uncomfortable, but, it, but it's working. So you, my point is you can, microflow is very available, right, um, along the way. When it starts getting blocked for a lot of people is the shame, the self-consciousness, or for me, uh, I say this a lot with skiing, 
um, self-expectation has ruined more ski days than anything else in the world, right? And the worst, flow is the worst for this. So this is really funny, but we talk about flow as the most pleasurable state on earth, and it is. But I get into a great flow state, I go skiing and say, like, I, you know, I learned a bunch of new tricks in the, in the terrain park in flow. The next time I come back, I expect to be able to perform at that level right again. And that's usually not how it works. What happens with flow, especially with athletics, but usually in general, when you can do a deep flow state, it's your body showing you, okay, this is what might be possible at the unconscious level, but you're still going to have to learn how to do all these things consciously along the way before you can get back here. So I feel like sometimes flow states give you a preview of what's possible without flow. And I always say, for example, with skiing, my favorite day, though it's a miserable day physically, my favorite days are the days that I do everything I did previously in flow, out of flow, right? Because um, it, it's proof that I've actually mastered these skills. It's usually, they say you in sports, they say you can win a championship without flow mm. if it's a one game champ. You can't win a seven game series without flow. It's not, that, that'll never happen. But if it's a single, it's one game of Super Bowl, for example, um, you can probably pull that off without flow, but you'll never want to do it again because it's so miserable. Yeah. So you can perform at your best without the sport, without flow, but it's rare. I love those days, even though they are miserable. It's because right? it's become a part of you. It's become a part of you. And now you can, you, like, you can execute it when you're tired, when you're not. Yeah. Like that's what, I, that, then I'm really excited because then I'm like, oh, I got this. And I can trust yeah. that the skill is built in. That's exciting. I think, I, I love that analogy, your just story of, of drawing and how you share that because- there's that quote that what we do in the dark shines in the light. We're constantly being fed people's highlight reels of of their unconscious competency of what they're doing. That's like that's taken them um, a long time. Oftentimes they get to that point and we don't see the you dark see. times. We don't see them consciously practicing. By the that. way, I should tell you, my best friend started doing. It. He was teaching himself guitar, uh -huh. and he started doing it. And I was like, oh wow, that's really brave. Yeah. I don't know if I could do that. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? So right. I watched somebody else do it first. I was like, okay, that's a really good idea. And I'm really a fan of it because for the same reason you pointed out, like it bugs me on social media where right. you get like the best lives and, and, and nothing else. Um, and I also think um, I'm not a fan of social media. I tend to think social media broke the world, but, <laughs> but so immediate feedback is a flow trigger. And uh, what flow follows focus when feedback is immediate, we don't have to wonder how we perform. We know, right? So one of the reasons sports are so flowy is you either serve the tennis ball into the net or you got it into the court, right? Yeah. In or out, you know, immediate, that's immediate feedback. The internet, social media can be really great for a little bit of immediate feedback. I don't think it's useful for any other per I mean, there are some good ways to do business on social media that I think are, are probably useful. Um, but for creativity and immediate feedback, I think it's a great tool for that um, and really, really useful. But I watched a friend of mine do it and I was like, oh my God, if he was willing to be like really bad, because like yeah. a bad drawing is one thing. Listening to somebody learning how to play guitar <laughs> is kind of brutal, right? Yeah. Like it's, 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 it's maybe a little worse. And he was so brave with it. And I was watching, and I was like, oh, well, I've got the same, like I got the same shame and embarrassment and I only like to be great in public too. Right. So let me go right at this. Yeah. Let me let me try this too. So thank you for giving good credit for it, but I <laughs> stole it from somebody who's not mine. No, it's good. It's important for those reminders um, in a world where everyone's just showing the best version of themselves. Can you, before we move on, can you just give those definitions of micro versus macro flow yeah, and then sure. actually define what those four stages are just to clarify that yeah. as well? Flow is a spectrum. It's not a singular experience. Um, it's a spectrum of experiences. I always say it's like emotions, anger. You're a little irked, you're homicidally murderous, right? It's the same emotion, anger. Flow shows up on a spectrum. Micro flow to macro flow. So let me back up a little bit. Flow has, how do you know if you're in flow or out of flow? How do you know if your friend's in flow? The state has six core we call them phenomenological characteristics, meaning this is how the experience makes you feel, right? Complete concentration on the task at hand, a merger of action and awareness. I mentioned some of these earlier, the vanishing of self, the time dilation, 
we don't feel peak performance. That's not our internal experience. That's I was I could yeah, be looking at you in flow, witnessed. right? And I see you performing at your best. Inside, it feels like a sense of control. Oh, I can control things I can't normally control. My words are doing amazing things at 4 a.m. on a Tuesday, and that doesn't normally happen, right? Like, wow, I got all this control of my sentence, or I keep shooting baskets and the hoop is as big as a hula hoop and I can't miss, right? And finally, the experience is autotelic, meaning an end in itself, meaning it's so pleasurable. Autotelic? Autotelic is okay. a Greek term for an end in itself. And it tries to describe the fact that flow is so joyous, so addictive, so pleasurable, so much of our best feeling on earth that once an activity starts producing flow, we automatically go back to that activity. We're just obsessed with it. It doesn't take effort to go do it. We just want to keep doing it, right? Um, that's autotelic. So when we measure micro to macro flow, micro flow is those six conditions showed up, but they're like one or two. They're turned on the volume knob. It's like one or two. So you go to work, you sit down to write an email to your boss and you get so, it's supposed to take two minutes. You get so sucked into what you have to say that like 45 minutes goes by, you've written an essay instead of a paragraph. And maybe so the entire voice in your head, self-consciousness didn't totally fade away, but bodily awareness did. And when you sort of wake back up, you realize you have to run to the bathroom, right? This happens to all of us all the time. This is like a daily experience. So microflow is actually really common. In fact, Csikszentmihalyi, the godfather of flow psychology, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, uh, in a study dating, I want to say back into the 80s, 1980s, so 40 years ago at this point, found that people spend about 5% of their work life in 10, five to 10% 10 of their work life in microflow, often without even noticing it. So microflow is really common. It's, really, it's the low grade version of it. Um, the other side, macro flow to when all those things are turned up to 11. And until the 1950s, macro flow wasn't a thing. We talked about that as a spiritual experience, religious experiences or spiritual experiences or mystical experiences. And it was Abraham Maslow was studying commonalities among successful people. And he found that all the successful people he was studying all use flow to alter their consciousness, and perform at their best. But everybody in this particular study group was an atheist. So it was the first time somebody went, oh, this isn't just reserved for religious people or spiritual people. This is available for everybody. That was actually where Csikszentmihalyi came from. So Maslow figured out, pre-Maslow, it's a spiritual experience. Maslow's like, oh no, super successful people have this. Csikszentmihalyi comes along a decade later and says, what about everybody else? What about like the common man and woman? What do they feel when they explore, when they you know experience optimal performance? And that was his quest. That was what he started out trying to figure out is, is it the same? Is it different? It's obviously the same. But so macro flow is, is, is really powerful. And, and some of the weirder uh, out-of-body experiences, cosmic unity, that feeling of oneness with everything. These are common experiences in macro flow. We understand the neurobiology. Um, behind them. By the way, since you have a slightly more spiritual audience, let me just say this out loud. Just because there's science at the heart of something does not say anything about the greater why question, right? I learned this years ago from my mentor, Andrew Newberg, who started out, you know, doing research on Franciscan nuns and Tibetan Buddhists who felt cosmic unity, oneness with everything, and he wanted to know where it came from. And um, this was this was really early work for me in flow, but he taught me one, my field uh, in general in all states in general, the field of studying that has tremendous advancement between so when scientists sit down with spiritual folks and have conversations and try to figure out what the hell where the commonality is and what's going on. That's where most of the progress has come from in the past 30 years and a lot of the fields that you're interested in, the conversations we're having, it was these conversations. And I always just want to tell people, I am an agnostic. I have no idea and um, one way or the other. And I like the mystery. I like not knowing. I'm really comfortable with that. I like the uncertainty. A lot of people don't. One way or another, just because I'm talking about biology, it doesn't answer any of the why questions. Totally. We're just talking about how. Yeah. Um, I had to say that. Sorry. That yeah, no, was good. <laughs> um, macro flow, micro flow. Macro flow is the mystical experience, micro flow. Um, one of the things that's really important for anybody interested in peak performance, one of the things that you learn how to do is macro flow is really common. How do you turn up the volume on a macro flow state to get it 
to, or a micro flow state to yep. get it to a macro flow state. So that's one of the things that we've started to learn how to do. Um, the second thing you asked about is, I said flow is a four stage cycle. On the front end is the struggle phase, it's a loading phase. And this is really good because you you broke down the, the you know, Mm -hmm. consciousness, the associated process, unconscious uh, learning. Struggle is about using your conscious mind to really think hard about, ab about it. And it's usually a, a loading phase where you're loading then overloading the brain with information that is followed by a what's called a release phase. You literally have to take your mind off the problem. So what you wanna do is pass the problem over from the conscious mind to the subconscious mind to solve it, right? And you can only do that by taking your mind off the problem. So that's what happens in the release phase. And usually there's usually activities that are really good for that. Low grade physical activity that doesn't exhaust you, but like a long walk is a, is, is a really famous way uh, for people to go through a release phase. Gardening, um, building model airplanes actually and model dinosaurs, like building models. There's research that shows this is a phenomenal release activity. Drawing is a good a good activity there. Um, TV doesn't work. TV will actually block. The next stage is flow and, and it'll end up blocking flow because of how it affects your brain waves. But you get the idea. Third stage is flow itself. And flow is a high energy state. It takes a lot of energy to produce. So on the back end of a flow state, there's a recovery phase. And the recovery phase is important for a couple of reasons. One, you have to, if you got into flow, you need that recovery phase if you actually want to learn what you learned in flow, right? We need deep delta wave sleep to pass things into long-term memory. So really important on the back end of a flow state, you could get this massively amplified learning. So you've taken it all in, but it's not locked yet. It's not locked into long-term storage. And if you don't sleep seven, eight hours the night after a really powerful flow state, you just sort of wasted that flow state. You might've had fun, but you it hasn't, help performance in the long run and hasn't helped learning in the long run, that sort of thing. So that's the four stages of the flow cycle and that's the spectrum of flow. What I would like to touch on next is some kind of like practical, useful things. I mean, we touched on many, but in regards to individuals that want to set up their environment to help it be conducive to flow, um, I would love for you to like, what are some common triggers, things that are extremely helpful for things to alter within their environment, within their workspace, within their home that can allow them to go through those four stages more easily? Flow follows focus. Can only show up when all of our attention is right here, right now. I said, that's what all the flow triggers do. The first and most important flow trigger is complete concentration, right? So when it comes to, uh, in, let's talk about individual flow, not group yeah. flow, the shared collective sure. version. Let's just stay with individual flow for a second. This means, first of all, you have to practice distraction management. Like mm -hmm. before you move into your workspace, you got to manic turn off your email, turn off your smartphone, messages, notifications, to have conversations with your, you know, if you're working from home, talk to your partner, talk to your spouse, talk to your kids, talk to your roommates. If you're in an office, Talk to your boss, talk to your coworkers, right? I always tell people that the distractions are terrible for flow. In fact, there's uh, there was work done, uh, the guy there's uh, Timothy Lister, and I can't remember who his partner was. Uh, they wrote PeopleSoft, old, old school coders from the back from the 90s and, and the early thousands did a lot of work on flow. They were working on flow and coders and they, they, they found that if coders get knocked out of flow, it'll take them a minimum of 15 minutes to get back in if they can even get back in at all. So those distractions are really costly. They're gonna block, keep you out of flow. And even if you do get into flow, they can knock you back out on this big cost there. So one, you wanna just remove all the distractions. This also tells us um, one thing across the boards, open office plans are a disaster. Mm -hmm. They're just a disaster. Because um, even in group flow, the shared collective version of flow, the first thing you need to do is you want to wall your the group off from the rest of the world. So you don't need individual concentration. You, you, you need group concentration. And so that's um, distraction management is, is one of the best places to start there. I have found, not always the case, um, novelty is a flow trigger. And I like 
a space that if I got a view of beautiful nature, it's really useful. It may not be everybody, but you get a lot of novelty in there. So you just, I can look up and, you know, catch little bits of, oh, wow, a hawk just flew through that. It's, that novelty, a little bit of dopamine, tiny little, which is driving focus. So um, useful. Um, so that's that's one thing I, I often think about. Hmm. Um, it's beyond that is interesting because it doesn't seem like there's a formula that works across the boards for everybody. People are very, very, very individual. Um, so the, I think it's more about how you manicure your internal state, but there are, so let's talk about the simplest things people can do if they want more flow in their life um, from a practical standpoint. Um, it's, it's remarkably obvious, but it's very true. So we all have uh, what we call a primary flow activity, uh, which is essentially, it's that thing you've done since you were a little kid that most of the time just drops you into flow, right? We can say it really technically that like, this is the thing that has the flow triggers that you are most susceptible for, blah, blah, blah. But it's really whatever you've done your whole life that is most likely to drop you into flow. For me, it's skiing. My wife, it's, you know, hiking our dogs to the back country. My best friend is playing the guitar as we talked about a second ago. I don't know, I don't know. some people it's dancing samba, some people it's playing with their kids, some people, you know, the list goes on. But flow is essentially a focusing skill. So one of the things that we know is the more flow you get, the more flow you get. So I go skiing on Saturday, ski all day, get into a flow state. It means I'm gonna have an easier time getting into flow on Monday hmm. or Tuesday or Wednesday. Flow gets more flow. Flow gets more flow. It's a focusing skill. It's like yeah. mindfulness, right? The more you meditate, the better you get at, 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 at meditation because you're learning how to you focus, become. right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So the same thing is happening with flow. So that's A. B, two other things that are really critical here. Um, when we drop into flow, we experience massively heightened uh, happiness, well-being, and creativity. Creativity in some studies spikes 400 to 700% above baseline. Nobody's really tried to measure the, the actual impact on happiness and well-being other than to say that we know the happiest people on earth are the people with the most flow in their lives. The people who score off the charts for overall life satisfaction and well-being are the people with the most flow in their lives. So intimately tied with that stuff. But the heightened creativity and the heightened productivity and the heightened happiness will outlast a flow state by a day, maybe two. Um, so that's cool too. Also, as we move into flow, it tends to reset our nervous system. So flow will push all the stress hormones out of our system. So just from a general performance standpoint, right, you're resetting your nervous system. Anxiety is blocks flow, but it blocks learning. It blocks all kinds of performance. So, so there's a lot of benefits psychologically, emotionally, and performance-wise from doubling down on your primary flow activity. And this is the very thing as we get older, what do we do? We set down childish things, right? The surfboard goes away, the skateboard goes away. No, no, I've got responsibilities now. I've got a, and it's literally the worst thing we can possibly do. In fact, burnout, which is so prevalent today, over and over and over again, we know that the if you're burned out, the single best thing you can do to restore yourself to, you know, normal is double down in your primary flow activity. What the research shows is like, you don't need a ton of time. Three to four hours a week is often enough to, to do the job. And you can usually, if you want, you can split that up into a couple of sessions, but it's literally like one afternoon a week. You should probably devote to something that's really flowy for yourself for this reason. That's not a way of manicuring your space and your sure. environment, but it's a way of manicuring your life. Yeah. For, to maximize no, flow. That's important. I mean, it's a it's a combination of the things we don't do and the things we do do, right? Mm -hmm. So the things we don't do, putting technology, the phone in a different room when we're trying to write a book, right? Or like the things that we just el eliminate those distractions like you spoke to. And then the things that we can do internally, manicuring, but then also externally in our environment, whether it's, you know, whatever it is for people, essential oils or a view right, right. or like things that can really help you just kind of sink into what, into presence. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And it, and it's, it's, it is very just individual, of course. Yeah. And we know this, um, we know that like, culture does play, 
sh- a role in shaping how we get into flow. Yeah. And it's not overarching and the neurobiology kind of works across the words, but there's, there's some culture and it, it's here that that shows up, right? Yeah. So you gave that one. Is there any other quick practical ones outside of just doing some other f- things that bring you into flow, but quick practical things? Is there anything else that w- has really worked for you before it happened to the next thing? All the flow triggers are super effective. Uh, dep- okay, so let me give you just another practical tip for me. I have to read a lot of neuroscience textbooks. Um, as you can imagine, they're fascinating. <laughs> they're thrillers, really, just page turners. <laughs> um, and uh, so, and I, naturally, like I want to read in flow because learning is significantly amplified and pattern recognition is significantly mm. amplified. So when I have to read a bunch, I save them up I, until I have like two or two or three textbooks to read. And I will go, I usually get a hotel room with a view for the same novelty reason. Like I, I find a hotel room somewhere, get a balcony and I'll sit on that balcony yeah. and um, purposefully read there for novelty, right? Novelty is a flow trigger. This is this, you know, if I, if it, that's, not available to me, I'll drive across town and go to a coffee shop I've never been in, mm-hmm. right? Just that little bit of extra novelty is going to amplify focus and help you drive you towards flow. And um, so that's another just like really simple, easy sort of practical tip. Um, I always say that the if you're interested in more flow in your life, the place you have to sort of start is uh, what I like to talk about is the positive psychology basics. So positive psychology spent about 30 years sort of trying to figure out what do we need to do to get into flow? And they weren't talking about flow itself, like creating the flow state. They were just like, to perform at your best, what are the basics? And there's sort of four things that have come out of that uh, that are really important. One, you need regular sleep, seven, eight hours of sleep a night. Flow is a very high energy state. Sure, you can get into flow, you know, you can get lucky, stay up all night and you can drop into flow. It'll happen, certainly, but it's not reliable, repeatable, sustainable over a long haul. It's a bad peak performance strategy. So it's a general rule, seven, eight hours of sleep a night for all of us if you want to maximize flow. Hydration, nutrition, right? There's no secret, there's no one, and there's definitely no flow diet at all. <laughs> um, but hydration and nutrition, right? We It's a high energy state. This is kind of a no-brainer. The one that's tricky here, um, this is, I'm talking about ways to produce physical energy, right? Like to get into a flow state, social support. And people hear about social support as a, like a psychological safety thing and a mental health concern, which it is. But what's really interesting is that whenever we fa- face a situation, right? Could be an opportunity right? Or a challenge I want to rise towards, or it could be a threat that I want to run away from. And we have to evaluate it. And this happens all day long to all of us. So when we have in that situation, the brain, when it evaluates, one of the things it's asked is, do you have people around you who love you, who have your back? Because if you got folks around who love you, who got your back, and you have a support system, coworkers who, you know, that sort of thing. Well, if you fuck up and fail, they can pick you up again and you're much more willing to take the chance. And then that this thing, the situation is an opportunity and you won't get a huge stress response. A huge stress response takes a tremendous amount of energy. It burns a ton of energy. So it will end up blocking flow. Instead, you'll get a much more sympathetic response. And um, obviously if you don't have that social support network and you, and, and you keep getting these huge stress responses, you're not going to have the energy left for flow. So it's, and you don't, you don't need tons of friends, tons of family. You need a couple of relationships that you sort of regularly check in with. I'm an extreme introvert. I don't need a whole lot of contact. People who are really extroverted might need more, but you got to sort of figure out what you want and you want to get it on a daily basis. The other three things, um, the other things you want to think about is anxiety blocks flow, right? We talked about that challenge skills balance, right? And obviously too much anxiety is just going to push you out of that sweet spot. And because you know you got to like push on your skills anyways, right? So there's going to be a little anxiety in this anyways. You're going to have a little bit of norepinephrine in your system anyways. So people who are really good at flow and really good at dropping into flow before you even get to what you can do to get into flow will make sure they're manicuring their nervous system, right? And there's three, the three best ways 
there are a couple others, but the three best ways to sort of manicure, to, you know, calm yourself down, daily gratitude practice, daily mindfulness practice, or regular exercise, right? Great. And gratitude practice takes five minutes. Yeah. Mindfulness for stress reduction, right? It's 11 minutes. Exercise for stress reduction, you wanna exercise until it gets quiet upstairs and your lungs open up, which is a signal that the brain has released nitrous oxide. Same thing happens in flow, it pushes stress hormones out of your system. I tell people normal conditions do one a day, right? And if you press for time, do a gratitude list. Um, it also has the extra bonus. We did some work with uh, uh, Glenn Fox, who's at USC. He's a, one of the world's leading uh, gratitude experts. He studies the neuro, he's a neuroscientist. Uh, we found that a regular gratitude practice also makes you flow prone. So you wanna increase the amount of flow in your life. Gratitude is, is one easy way to get there. Um, but if there's a lot going on, do two a day, right? At the Flow Research Collective during COVID, we asked our, our employees, the folks working with us to do three a day. We're a peak performance organization. We want our people performing at their best. Everybody's freaked out during COVID and super stressed. And they were turning to us for help. So I couldn't have freaked out people, right? So I was like, all right, you wanna work here? Gratitude practice, mindfulness, regular exercise every day, no matter what, otherwise like you can't, you can't do this job right mm -hmm. now. So, those are all sort of the basics, right? And and that's where I start. And then you want to start playing with the flow triggers, yeah. right? And um, I always tell people, start with distraction management, right? Start also uh, complete concentration. One of the things people always want to know is, well, how long should I focus for, right, if I can? And I always say you want to start by starting, right? You want to sort of like wall off your focus flow time from the world. But if in the beginning you can only get 10 minutes, 20 minutes, we'll start there, right? Um, flow massively amplifies productivity, so you're gonna get time back, right? You end up getting time back for this, but what you really would like to be able to do is 90 to 120 minutes. The reason is the brain has a built-in focus slot for 90 to 120 minutes long. How do we know this? We also have a dreaming slot, a sleep cycle, it's 90 to 120 minutes long. We have a sleep cycle, we have a waking cycle. It's the exact opposite. We all know about the sleep side, we're less aware of the waking side, but the brain is designed to focus for like 90 to 110 minutes at a time. It can mm -hmm. do it really, really well. So what happens is as you start working towards that, um, you'll find it gets easier, right? Because you're actually just taking advantage of your natural biology that way. So I was talking, when you start with complete concentration, that's where I start, distraction management. See if you can get 90 to 120 minutes. The next thing that is really helpful here is task focus, not ego focus. So one of the things that happens in flow neurobiologically is our prefrontal cortex deactivates. Your ego lives in your prefrontal cortex. So if I'm writing and I'm thinking about like how my audience is gonna feel about my words, right? Are they gonna like them? Are they gonna not? That's an extrinsic motivator. That's an outside thing. And it fires up my prefrontal cortex and gets my ego involved, right? You wanna stay task focused, not ego focused. Um, and finally, uh, the last thing I mentioned this earlier, autonomy and attention, they're coupled systems. So if you don't have full autonomy on the task, you wanna do what I talked about earlier, you wanna reframe that task a little bit. So, okay, this, I gotta, I, I gotta write, you know, 500 words about data caves, right? Not super excited and I'm not gonna write like Charles Dickens this time. Um, so I don't wanna write the story, I'm not motivated, but and maybe 90% of that story is bullshit, but there's like this 10% thing where, oh, if I write about data caves, I'm gonna have to learn about holographic displays, for example. I'm kind of into holographic displays. So, okay, now I've reframed it. Yeah, I gotta do all this other work, but this is the thing that I really care about. I've got a little passion or curiosity. Um, now I've got a little more autonomy. Mm -hmm. So this is how you essentially you know, it's not an environmental space because that's sort of individual, but these things are true across the boards for all of us. So this is sort of how you manicure the mental space yeah. for flow. Very thorough. Thank you for diving into all of that. I think it's extremely also helpful for me. I'm in the 
middle of building out a course right now and it feels like I'm waking up and at the bottom of the hill of this mountain constantly. And uh, and so being able to chunk it up into different tasks, you know, utilize these triggers and novel kind of moments to be able to uh, just get into the flow of it, right? And into the process of it and not be so identified with the result of what it's going to be, but allow that to unfold naturally. Um, the last thing that I want to dive into today is, as I mentioned earlier, I'm so fascinated in how group flow unfolds and how when you bring, and I sometimes do these mastermind dinners, I bring together eight people who just like a Jeffersonian type style type dinner or on a specific topic of life. And I always find that there's just another level of intelligence that opens up when the group of individuals come kind of sink and flow in conversation mm -hmm. that isn't available maybe just as an individual. There's a new energy that becomes available. And so I'm just curious your thoughts on, on what becomes possible when multiple consciousnesses come together into flow. Do you want the long technical geeky science answer or do you want the short answer? Uh, give us the give us the punchline and then work our way through it maybe a little bit. So this is what group flow is so great for. It maximizes choice and creativity. So an individual in flow has what I like to talk about as 360 degree creativity, meaning you're performing at your best. So any direction you go in, right, you're going to be great at. But a group together where everybody has 360 degrees that that what you can produce together is so much more powerful than one you can produce alone this is by the way the reason group flow is everybody's favorite experience on earth is this very thing we're talking about if there's the most freedom we literally have the most freedom inside a group flow because you've got everybody performing at your best. So obviously a team is more powerful than an individual and a team performing at the best where everybody is in flow. You can go in a ton of directions and get a ton of stuff done. So that's sort of the medium answer yeah. in between. Um, we can talk about why it happens neurobiologically and, and, and all that stuff and, and where it comes from. Um, it's, tr it's truly, you know, rare and wonderful and it certainly it massively amplifies learning and there's certain like learning to park ski we talk about this a lot where like anything physically dangerous where like or difficult where there could be pain involved it is so much easier to learn in group flow than under any other circumstances even if you get to flow solo so um spend a lot of time trying to like in athletic endeavor trying to like preconditions for group flow are really, really, really important. Um, and uh, they change too, because interpersonal flow, me and you talking, right? We got great conversation. We got so sucked in. I don't know how much time has passed. You don't know how much time has passed. That's low grade micro, right? Micro flow, but it's low grade micro group flow, which is what we've been experiencing here today. Um, delicious and wonderful. Turn up that crank to macro flow, and it's you know it's sort of mind blowing mm -hmm. in the sort of what what people can actually accomplish. It's so exciting once you start to feel that, um, and I just feel like there's the there's that old saying of like two horses pulling a carriage is not twice as fast; it's three times as fast. There's this exponential component. I don't even know if that's true, but there's this exponential. Yeah, I'm trying to do the math and I'm like, is this true? Is this work? I don't think I know enough about horses and carriages and pulling. <laughs> but but when you bring multiple individuals together, there is that exponential feel, yeah, right? Totally. Certainly. And whatever it is, whether it's a sport dynamic, which is very common in, in people understanding this, but then also just in conversation and looking to uncover solutions to pressing challenges and problems. Well, it's also, I mean, it's at the heart of music, yeah. right? I mean, more than any, like if you're looking for like the singular pinnacle of, of, of group low, improv comedy is great, but I, music is really, jazz is of course the classic example of this with it when yeah. it's improv jazz. Um, but uh, I could, you know, anytime you have a, a band comes together and the music starts to soar, that's, you know, mm -hmm. group flow in action. And it's, um, it's interesting, right? Because that's at the point that the music starts to be able to talk about things that the music's not talking about, mm. right? The whole, that's what's interesting to me about it is this is these, that exponential effect that I always say with flow and, and group flow, the biology, the, the science can answer, there's 90% of the stuff 
we understand. But there's 10% of the things that start to happen in flow and in group flow that's still a little bit of a mystery, right? Where the science sort of runs aground and I love that mystery. I don't necessarily have to reach for metaphysical solutions exactly um, to solve it. But I, I just, I, but what's always just stayed with me is that that's really where interesting meanings start showing up. And that's what's weird is the meaning gets amplified, right? You were talking about it in your dinner party or something, the conversation got a lot farther than anybody expected it to go. What happens? Somebody turned up the meaning tap, right? That's a little weird, right? I can talk about heightened pattern recognition and blah, blah, blah in the brain for a real long time, but am I going to be able to explain how the meaning tab gets turned up in group flow in the way that it does? Not so much. You know what I mean? I run out of explanation at a, at a certain point, but it's a real phenomenon that's, you know, super fun and boy, can you get farther faster. It's so powerful. It's exciting. And as I kind of feel into the vision of like the future of the human potential, um, I'm also very fascinated with like these cities, right? The Sanskrit term for cities are like kind of these like, they, 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 they're described as like spiritual superpowers that become available. Oh, you, the cities. Yeah. I thought, I thought you, it was like no, London, not, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, yeah. the cities. Okay, S -I -B -D. I, yeah. Well, you know, uh, by the way, there's spiritual superpowers and they're distractions on the path. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. They're not, they're not the good thing. They're the yeah, bad thing. For sure. They, yeah. But I, I, it's an interesting marker of possibility when you hear about these individuals that tap to this place within themselves that, create these miraculous moments or what people would see as superhuman. I'm just curious in closing here, because I know I could go for hours and hours and hours. Um, what do you make of when you turn that macro flow dial up to 11 and those states of consciousness become so rapturous that mystical things start happening? I'm curious what- How I think about it? Yeah. So um, what I learned sort of early on in my career, um, I don't know where, it, it, I think Dr. Newberg, Andy Newberg was the first person to, to have this conversation, but he, this is how he approached it. And you have, so back in the nineties, the people who sort of laid the foundation for, for what you're doing now and, and, and things like that, you have to understand we, it was not, like you were risking your career talking about these kinds of things. Um, Dr. Newberg, got forced essentially out of the University of Pennsylvania for his research on spiritual topics, right? Like this was really taboo. Mm -hmm. So people really, and even writing about it in West of Jesus, which was my first book on, on this, I was like, if this goes wrong, I'm like a new age laughing stock whose career is over, right? And I knew it and it was real. I was scared, right? And people hear that now and they're like, really? And I'm like, you, it was a very different time. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was really easy to flush a career that way um, with these kinds of discussions. My, But what I was taught was, one, if something shows up globally before the era of mass communication, right? Before, especially before we have international travel of any kind, trade routes, um, any sort of like, Yes, the, the the Polynesians did manage to you know sail in enormous enormous distances uh, with with starlight and could navigate most of the whole Pacific. So there was a lot of travel was possible, but it was very very slow. Um, but I always said if it shows up in multiple cultures, right before we've got telephones yeah. and telegraphs and you know all that stuff, um, there's a lot of smoke there. You won't is it fire? Don't know. But there's enough smoke that you want to take a closer look. This is what happened when we looked at cosmic unity. Oneness with everything. Oneness with everything was like this thing. You go back to the 80s, walk into a shrink's office and say, God, I was, you know, I was writing the other day. I got into this state of consciousness and I like merged with the words and I became one with the universe. You were going to a nut house. They were locking you up. Like that's what was happening, right? And Newberg came along and said, hey, wait a minute. This shows up. We've got Franciscan nuns. We got Tibetan Buddhists. We got like, we got to look at this. There's some biology here. So what I've learned is that if it shows up cross-culturally, 
before mass communication, there's probably some kind of biology. Again, biology is just a how, it's not a why. It doesn't tell yeah. us anything about, about the why. But um, the how shows up. And so that's one, that's the first thing I think about. So when I look at these phenomenon, and that has been, now there are certain things. So for example, going back to the cities, one of the cities is levitation. Yeah. There's zero proof that that's real. There's, I mean, like people have gone, looked, really tried to figure it out. Um, nobody's, nobody's come back and said no to the, 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 right? There's a bunch of other cities where you're like, oh no, that like, you know, two people thinking the same thoughts at the same time. That happens a lot in group flow, right? Mm -hmm. Where you, you, you get, and it's not quite levitation. And I can sort of talk about pattern recognition and cueing sure. and everything else, but I don't think it gets to the answer, right? Like I don't, like I, I always say flow can explain synchronicity. It can't explain serendipity. Mm. And we know that when you start getting into flow regularly, synchronous st things start happening in your life and serendipitous things start happening in your life. And we can explain the first half of it, the second half you're like, I don't know what this is, right? I have made an argument. Uh, there were a bunch of us, uh, uh, John Hagel, Salim Ismail, a couple other people who, for a while we were trying to figure out what is luck? How do you codify luck? Can you put science around luck? And I've spent a really long time trying to th thinking that what we actually mean by luck, though this just moves the needle a little bit, it doesn't answer the question, is um, frequent access to flow, regular flow states, because lucky things start to happen. Now I can explain a lot of it by sort of turning up pattern recognition and your ability to recognize more opportunity in the world and its impact on your mood and you're less judgmental and you're like, so you're letting more stuff in, you're noticing more opportunities. And I can use that to explain 60%, 70%, right? Like you, you, it makes sense, but you run into that wall of like, what the hell is this? Serendipity, synchrony. And you, we don't have answers. Maybe it's absolutely nothing. I'm going to argue that there's probably some biology there that we haven't yet discovered. Um, I don't quite know what it is. But um, to me, these are the reasons this is like, maybe flow has been like a lifelong passion and purpose that's like different from animals and that it doesn't, it hasn't broken me in any, in any way, shape or form. But um, I mean, I guess it's, it's broken my head open a couple of times where like I've gotten so frustrated trying to be able to solve certain puzzles, but eventually I get them. Um, but this is one of the reasons I like sort of the, you know, I, a friend, Michael, I was talking about who plays guitar. He likes to say, one of the great things about guitar is I'll never run out of guitar, Yeah. right? You never run out of guitar. I'll never run out of drawing. I'll also, I don't think ever run out of flow questions, right? Like, so this is one of the reasons I love this topic so much is because it allows you to sort of get closer and closer and closer to these really interesting mysteries. And they force you, to, so I'll give you a, a really simple example um, as a way to maybe wrap this up. Um, but I think, so if you're very spiritually minded, this conversation and flow, it sort of forces you to make a choice, right? You have to either come down and say, okay, God's in the biology, or you have to say God's in what remains after the biology, biological explanation, right? Hmm. So it's one or the other, and you gotta you gotta sort of pick. And what's interesting is on the God is in the what remains category, right? Which is where I think a lot of people, spiritual people, are much more comfortable, right? They're uncomfortable with the idea that biology and spirituality might be the same thing, right? One might be a mechanism for the other, whatever any of these words mean, but like, and they want. The, the spirituality to live in the remainder, but that remainder is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Back before we started doing right. our work in the early 1990s, yeah. out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, cosmic unity, trance states, meditative states, all this stuff, that was the mystery. We had no idea. Now, all of that is, I don't wanna say colonized territory because there's still a bunch of, you know, there's still a bunch of mystery left, but it's shrinking and it's shrinking and it's shrinking. And I just find this fascinating. I don't come down one way or another. Right. Um, I just find the whole thing really interesting. And you know, I never run out of flow for that reason. 
I'm also very much in the camp of being comfortable with just, I don't know, saying that and being okay with it and being at ease with that mystery. And I've met certain individuals a couple of times in my life where it's very clear they have these spiritual gifts, you know, and I, you know, the biology doesn't fully account for the story of consciousness and the, its various manifestations of what becomes possible within, um, within certain people's conscious experience. And so, I'm, I'm just so fascinated as we start to discover more and more of the possibilities of consciousness and what happens with certain individuals that have that are tapped into ways that I just can't physically explain. Maybe we'll all just it'll all be explainable one day as that margin continues to shrink as it has been. But I'm hoping <laughs> I'm hoping that we can one day explain. That when we, I mean, if I don't get all the, the answers, I'm hoping that you get them when you die. Yeah. Like even <laughs> if just for like a minute, right? I would certainly like, yeah, I'd, I'd like the answers. I'm sure. certainly, certainly, certainly super curious about it. One of the things, you know, I've spent my career studying those moments in time when impossible comes possible, right? That's what I've, that's what I've done. And, you know, I, I, I say in the art of the possible, there's always a secret, right? There's always a tool, a technique, a thing going on. Doesn't mean there's a trick. Right, um, but it, there there are tools and techniques and you know all that stuff. But um, it has led to because it's you know they're the people who are doing a lot of this work. Like if they weren't before they got into it, they end up as friends of mine. So I've got a collection of friends who have all done the impossible, and they're all ordinary, average, normal like you, like me, like everybody else, folks. And that's one of the things that I find, like there's nothing special about the people who do really special things, right? They've, they found a way to work, they found a way to tap into flow, they've, they've, they've done some stuff, but that's what's so interesting to me. And, you know, we talk about now the uncertainty, the, but like, that's what the impossible is, right? Like whether we're talking about physical performance or intellectual performance or that sort of stuff. So over and over and again, I've like sort of gone right up against that that mystery and been like, okay, this was, you know, absolute nonsense two weeks ago. And now this is a reality in this world. And that to me is as much of a, like a spiritual transformation for the planet as anything else, right? I, I tend to think that way. I, I'm really nervous around terms like spirituality and mysticism and these things because I, the definitions get very, right. they're yeah. very individual and they get very murky. And I'm, so I'm, a, I'm hesitant to, for years, I wouldn't even have the conversation out loud with you, yeah. but now I'm trying to have the conversation out loud um, a little bit more, but it's because the terms are so unclear, but certainly there's something magical going on there. Well, this conversation has been magical, Stephen. Thank you so much for all the different avenues we've been diving into today. For people that want to explore some of these topics more, I have like four of your books here. <laughs> Stealing Fire is great. The Rise of Superman, The Art of Impossible, all of these. A new book, Nar Country, which is available now. We'll link everything down in the description below. Um, any closing thoughts, things that you want to share where people can be pointed towards uh, before we wrap up? Yeah, I'm at, at Stephen Kotler on social media. Uh, StephenKotler.com is my website, flowresearchcollective.com. Flow Research is the, is the Flow website. If you're interested in training with us at all, getmoreflow.com is is where you, where you where you go for that. And um, as far as kind of a parting thought, I, I let me go back to, uh, let me just kind of reemphasize sort of what I just said a second ago, which is, you know, I have spent my career with people who have done the extraordinary, they all started out ordinary, yeah. right? They are all started out just like me and you. So that's the thing that, you know, I always want to close with because it, you know, we're all capable of so much more than we know, right? That's the moral of this story. Across the boards, um, we're all capable of so much more than we know. Um, and that I think is the best parting thought I can have because it, it's, it's usually helpful. Yeah. I think all of your content and your devotion to writing so much and sharing in the way you do 
help people realize how the extraordinary is possible for the ordinary person and like how we can actually find that in our life. So thank you for all the work that you're doing. I really oh, appreciate thank you it. For noticing. Beautiful. Well, everybody that's been tuning into this episode of the Know Thyself podcast, thank you for coming on this journey with us. If you thought, if you found something, heard something while watching this on YouTube or listening on audio that was particularly impactful for you, let us know in the comments section below. We'd love to hear that stuff. You can share clips um, that we post on social media. Everywhere you can find Stephen will be linked down in the description below. Until next time, be well.